This morning, we are starting a new series on the topic of perspective. And so for me, perspective is something that is so incredibly important. And we're going to be talking about a couple different vantage points throughout the month. We're going to talk about God's perspective on the church. A book that has uh, been, been talked about over and over and over and has really just, uh, just hit America strong is a book called uh, Letters to the Church by Francis Chan. Um, you've probably seen Pastor Dustin talk about this book a lot, and I've been reading through it. And I want to share with you guys uh, over, over the next couple of weeks just God's perspective on the church. And so that's going to be the last week in July. Next week, we're going to be talking about God's perspective on us. And I'm really excited for that one because it's so important. If you don't know who you are, if you don't know whose you are, then how do you function with confidence and knowing that you are purpose-filled, loved child of, of God? And so next week, we're going to be talking about God's perspective on us. But today, where it begins, uh, where, where we need to start, and we have to have the correct perspective on this before we can go to any of those, is what is our perspective, or what is God's perspective Right? Or what is, I'm sorry, I have it written down right here. Read, Josh. Our perspective on God. <laughs> We're going to talk about our perspective on God. And uh, if you would pray with me this morning before we dive into the word. Father, we just come to you today and we thank you um, for who you are. We thank you for the way that you love us. God, we thank you for uh, giving us your word to reveal who you are to us, God. And I pray that this morning as we open up the Bible and, and we dive into this, God, that you would just speak to us. Lord, if there's words that you desire for, for us to hear this morning, I pray that you would just speak to us. Lord, take full control, God, of, of my lips and my tongue and allow me to speak exactly what you have for your people today. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our perspective on God. The very first thing that came to my mind whenever I started looking at, at this specific topic was Job. Job. Job had a very unique, strong, biblical, amazing perspective on who God was. In fact, when I think of Job, I'm going to tell you, there's, there's a lot more to it, but when I think of Job, the thing that I think of is that God allowed Job to be tested, and Job lost not only his family, he lost everything that made him uh, valuable or, or, or had money. He lost everything, his home, his cattle, his family. And then here's Job, not only lost everything, but he's sitting here in the ruins of what used to be a kingdom almost in regards to how rich he was. He's sitting here in the ruins of it, covered in boils, sick, and his wife tells him, curse God and die. And what does he say to her, his response? He says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. What a, what a powerful perspective on God that Job has. And oftentimes, I, I don't dig any deeper into the story. I finish it right there. But the truth is, there's over 40 chapters in the book of Job. And if you read on, because after constant questioning from Job's friends, they finally drag it out of him what's deep inside and, and what he feels. And he begins to question God. In fact, in chapter 10, he really digs in and begins to talk about, I wish that I was never even born. I wish that I would have died at childbirth for even people who, who were born and died there at rest with the angels. Why do you condemn me, God? And he begins to really hammer in. And, and in fact, in Job 10, verse 1 through 3, he says this. He says, I am disgusted with my life. Let me complain freely. My bitter soul must complain. You ever find yourself in a similar feel, right? Like, I must complain. You ever get home to your spouse and you're like, oh, I got, I got to talk to you today. Let me tell you what happened at work. Like, I must complain. Here's Job speaking to God. I must complain. My bitter soul must complain. Verse 2, he says, I will say to God, don't simply condemn me, but tell me the charges you are bringing against me. It's getting bold. Verse 3, what do you gain by oppressing me? Why do you reject me? 
the work of your own hands while smiling on the schemes of the wicked. Job has has went from a place that we can all look up to and say, wow, what incredible character this man has in the midst of all of his trials to say, God is still good. And then he goes from that to being just like us. It's oddly comforting, isn't it? To know that that it's it's not just you that, that complains. It's not just you that questions, right? Here's the part that we don't normally get to hear audibly. But God spoke back to Job audibly. He says in Job chapter 38, did you hear me? I was in Job 10. So from Job 10 to 37, he is going back and forth with his friends, complaining and talking about how awful his life is. See, for me, I understand that that it's okay to complain. But there comes a time where you have to stop and recognize the blessing that you have in your life and end the complaining. Right? There's got to be a time where you go, okay, I had my time. I had my, my moment of sorrow and pity on myself. But the truth is, if you continue in your own self pity, there will be a time that God will bring it to an end. He will stop. And so here he is in chapter 38, verses 2 through 7. He says this Who is it that questions? My wisdom with such ignorant words. Ooh. That's not the scripture that you normally uh, remember and and memorize for, for, for you to repeat on for yourself in times of trial, right? Who is it that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? This sentence stops me dead in my tracks. Have you ever self righteously? complained about something only to be made to look like a fool because you go, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't see that perspective. You ever done that? Well, let me give you a prime example, okay? My wife will tell you that I am an extremely patient driver, right? Right? No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. It's, it's crazy. I'm, I'm telling you right now, people will cut me off and I'm just like, it's all right. I'm still going to get to where I'm going, right? Like, I don't get mad. But for whatever reason, it drives me nuts when people are sitting in front of me and they have a clear opportunity to go and they're just sitting there. I'm like, yo, Facebook can wait. Get off of your phone and go. It drives me nuts. If I'm sitting there and I'm waiting, I'm not even in a hurry. It's just like, how inconsiderate are you? Cut me off, you had a reason. You probably got somebody in the hospital you're rushing to go, see, it's okay. But you're just sitting there on your phone, like, what are you doing? And, and you know, and she knows this is rare, but, uh, you know, we pulled up to a, to a stoplight, and, and, you know, we, we're sitting there, and we got the green light. It's not even a red light, it's green, and I'm waiting to turn right, and the car in front of me is just sitting there. And I'm like, I don't like to use my horn, but I will. So I... Give it a tap, and I'm like, come on. And then, out of my blind side, I see the walker <laughs> coming across the street. And I'm like, oh, man. And you know, you try, you try and wave to the person in front of you because you, they saw you doing this, and now you're just like, oh. <laughs> can I take back my honk? I apologize. (laughs) And so here is Job, and God says to him, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? He goes on in verse 3, he says, brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Okay? He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstone? As the morning stars sang together and the angels shouted for joy. Verse 34 says, can you shout to the clouds and make it rain? Can you make lightning appear and cause it to strike wherever you direct? Who gives intuition to the heart and instinct to the mind who was wise enough to count all of the clouds 
Who can tilt the water jars of heaven when the parched ground is dry and the soil has hardened into clods? God continues, and in chapter 40, verse 2, he says, Do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critic, but do you have the answers? Job is given a healthy dose of perspective. A healthy dose. His, his mind is realigned, and, and just this passage of Scripture, whenever you look into it, it makes me realize that my problems, yeah, they're difficult for me, but it's not the end of the world. If I have breath in my lungs, God has a purpose and he has a reason. And the truth is he is sovereign, meaning that he is always good. I have never understood more than I do right now that there's something going on behind the scenes that maybe you just don't realize. That maybe you just don't understand. You know, and that's why the Bible says that God will give us a peace that passes understanding. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. I had somebody message me yesterday. They had a close family friend pass away. And in their message, they said, I don't understand. And I said, neither do I. I'm praying for you. And the truth is, God has a reason. And we don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that in the midst of our trial. Could you imagine being Job? I mean, his entire family just died. Not just one family member. His entire family, all of his wealth, his home, everything. And then on top of it, he got sick. If anybody has a reason to complain and be bitter, it's Job. But God sets him straight and reminds him, I am the Lord, your God. I will work everything together. For those who are called according to my name, I will work everything together for the good. Right? What a fresh perspective. You ever been corrected and you're just like, man, I don't want to hear that, but you're right. Truth is like surgery. It hurts, but it heals. It's necessary. We have to go through difficult times sometimes in order to see the truth and get a correct perspective. You see, my perspective oftentimes of God is really based on just my experiences and my experiences alone right? The prayers that I've prayed and that were answered, there's my perspective on God. The prayers that I prayed and they weren't answered, there's my perspective on God. My family, my relationships, my health, all of these things shape my perspective on God, but that's not how it should be. You see, your perspective on God, my perspective on God is extremely limited. Extremely limited. I've been told before uh, about perspective because I, I had a hard time understanding how can two people have completely different perspectives but both still be right? It's because our perspective is limited. It's, it's like if you, were to, if you were to take me and blindfold me and, and lead me to an elephant, and I'd never seen one before, and you, you put me right up next to the side of the elephant, and I'm blindfolded, and you tell me, go, go ahead and reach out and tell me what you feel. What is an elephant? And I reach out and I begin to feel, and I'm like, all right, an elephant is, is huge. It's like a wall. It's, it's warm, and it's, it's, it's really got a rough skin with, with some hair. Like, it's really big, right? And then you take someone else, and you put them at the front of the elephant, and you tell them, go ahead and, go ahead and feel and, and tell me what, what an elephant is. Well, an elephant seems to have a, something like a trunk that is taller than me, and it goes all the way down to the ground, and then you can, you can hug it. And if you reach around, you can feel really strong tusks, right? Both correct, both completely different. That's why it's important. Whenever we think about our perspective on God, it needs, it needs to be from the Bible. It can't just be from your experiences and your experiences alone because your experiences are completely different than someone else's. But if we read the word that he has given us, then we can develop the correct perspective of God. And the truth is, the more I read the Bible, the more I realize this aligns with my experience. And it explains some of the things that I have questions with. The word of God is there to keep me in line. 
You see, I had often thought God is, is especially when, when I, I wasn't a firm believer and I didn't read, I thought God is, is, a, is, a, is a king who is far away, who sits on a throne. Far away. And, and he decides who lives and who dies. Right? He is, he is the one that gives us orders and tells me how to not have fun in my life. That's what I thought of God, right? But the truth is, God is, he's a God who walks with you. He's the one who chose to live inside of you. He is, he is not only the judge, but he's the savior. He is the Lord. He's our redeemer, our protector, our healer. He's our father. He is holy. He is much more than I can go over in a short 30-minute message. And like I said, we need to learn our perspective on God from the Word. And so today, we're going we're gonna to dive into Daniel chapter 6. And we're going to be talking about Daniel, okay? And, 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 and really, I want to go over a couple of different perspectives. One from, from Daniel and his perspective on God, the king, and then these guys who uh, I call the satraps, okay? So I, I actually asked Al to put the entire chapter of 6 in Pro Presenter, but it takes me longer to read it than it does to explain it. So I want you to have it open so you can check me. I don't ever want you to take anything that I say is, is, is 100% true in gospel. I want you to compare what I say to the Word of God. And if it lines up, then take it. If it doesn't, then throw it away, right? Because that's, a, that's an incredibly heavy weight. I do everything that I can to make sure that I'm on, on with the Word of God. But, man, compare it. That's the only true perspective that you should have, okay? So, so in the book of Daniel chapter 6, what we have is, is it lines out kind of an organizational structure. And the way that this organizational structure works is there is 120 different providences. Each one of those providences has an advisor called a satrap over it. So 120 satraps, okay? And then there's three that are in charge of all of these, of these advisors, these satraps. There's three, and Daniel is one of those. And in, in, in fact, the Bible talks about how the king, his name is Darius, sees the, the, the character that Daniel has. And, and, and it says that he had plans to put Daniel in charge of all of the providences. That they were going to give him a different level of leadership, authority, power. And the satraps, wouldn't you know it, they didn't like that. And so they, dis, they, they came together and said, we're going to, we're going to figure out a way... To, to put Daniel in prison or kill him. We need to find a charge against him. Almost like a politician, they begin to dig into his life. They, they tried to find the, the closet, like the, the, the skeletons in his closet. And, and it says that after they thoroughly examined his life, they could not find any wrongdoing in his life. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. Why? Because he wasn't negligent. He was a man of character. He chose God in everything that he did. And so what did they do? They decided... We are going to create a law and a decree because the only way that we can get to him is if it has to do with his God. Because this dude prays a lot. And if we can, if we can find a way. So, so they go to the king and they say, may the king live forever. Yes, may I live forever. Right? And, and they're like, may the king live forever. We think that it would be a great idea if, if we put together this, this decree. This decree that cannot be overturned. That if anybody worships anyone, any other God or any other man for the next 30 days, that he be thrown into the lion's den. Right? Don't you, don't you think it's a good idea, king? May you live forever. And he's like, yeah. What is wrong with this dude? Wouldn't you think you would immediately go, hold on, what, 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 do, you, what do you want? Right? When, you're, when your kids come to you and they're like, man, you're the best parent ever. Your first thought is not, yeah, I know. Your first thought is, like, what do you want? What is it that you're trying to get out of me? And, and for whatever reason, the king does not see this, and he goes, yeah, yeah, that's great. And they go, let's, let's take it a step further. If, if, uh, if you sign this decree and we do it in the law with the, with the, the Medes and the Pers Persians, man, uh, we'll make it so that no one can overturn it. If anyone worships anybody except for you, okay, yeah, 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 let's do that. So he signs the decree makes it official, there's no overturning it. 
Well, then they go to Daniel's house, and Daniel has a, a window that opens directly towards the city, and there he prays three times a day. When he heard about this law, it didn't change his faithfulness to God. In fact, he, he went right back to where he normally went, and he prayed three times a day. The satraps found him. And then they came back to the king. And they know, obviously, the king loves Daniel. Why? Because the king had said, I'm going to put him in charge of everybody. And so they go, hey, king, hey, remember remember the, the decree that we just now did? Remember that? Yeah, I remember it. Remember how we said that nobody can worship anybody except for you because you were the greatest king? Yeah, 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 I remember that. Remember how you're, we can't overturn it? And, and no matter what, no matter who it is, like, it's done, it's sealed. They're going to have to go to the lion's den. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, 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 I remember. We did that. No one, no one, it can't be overturned. Daniel defies you. Daniel doesn't care about you. He is, he is still worshiping. The king was distressed. He was so upset. The Bible says that, that he spent the rest of the day doing everything that he could to get Daniel out of this predicament. Nothing he could do. So they brought Daniel. They put him down into the lion's den. They covered up the hole with a stone, and then they even had to put the, the, the signet ring from the king on wax to make sure that nobody broke the seal until the morning time. The Bible says that King Darius didn't have any entertainment that night, uh, that he, he didn't eat, he didn't sleep. He sat inside of his, in, a, in his room all night, and, and as, the, as the morning approached, he went out to the lion's den as soon as the sun was up because the term, the time had been over and then he begins to cry out, Daniel, did your God whom you continually serve, did he rescue you from the mouth of the lions? And almost like a movie, out of the quiet, Daniel responds back, may the king live forever. I'm all good. He said, I was innocent in the sight of God. I did no wrong, and he protected me from the lions. And so what happened is they pulled Daniel out of the lion's den, and then the men who conspired against him, they threw, him, threw, threw them and their families into the lion's den. And the Bible says that before they even touched the ground, the lions crushed their bones. And the cool thing is, at the end of Daniel, what happens is, verse 25 it says that after this King Darius wrote to all of the nations and the peoples of every language in all of the earth may you prosper greatly I issue a decree this guy and his decrees I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel for he is the living God and he endures forever his kingdom will not be destroyed his dominion will never end he rescues and saves he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and in the, in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So we're going to look real quickly at three different perspectives. And please understand, the Bible does not directly say exactly what the satrap's perspective was on God. It does not say if they were atheists, agnostic, or believers. It doesn't say that. But how many of you know that the way that you live and the actions in your life speak highly of who you are and what you believe? So as I began to read about the satraps and I see what they did, it is my opinion that the satraps believed they didn't need a God. It is my opinion that, that their perspective was really that they were their own God because the actions that they took was that I'm going to take it into my hands. I am not going to wait on the Lord. I am not going to trust in the Lord. I'm not even going to ask what his will or plan is for my life. They, they saw that somebody else was going to get more power than they had, and they took it upon themselves to try and figure out and scheme together. How can I get the power? How can I do it? And then on top of it, you see them treat the creation of God like a stepping stone to get to where they want to be. They take no consideration into the creation of God. In fact, they see someone who is diligently faithful to God, and they say, we're going we're gonna to destroy him. Instead of looking at Daniel and going, what does he have that I don't? Right? Instead of looking at him and going, man, he serves God, and he is getting promoted, why would they not go, man, I, I want what he has? Because really, it's not just power. 
that they're pursuing. It's, it's not just a, a position. They're pursuing fulfillment. They want to fill this void that is inside of their heart. And they want to do that because they, they think that power and authority is the way that they're going to get that. This burden is, is difficult, right? Because after you do everything in your own power to get to a position that you want, you still are left empty. Jim Carrey, the, the great theologian, <laughs> I'm just kidding. All righty. Jim Carrey says, I wish that every person had the opportunity to be rich and to be famous so that they could understand that that is not what brings you happiness. There's something deeper. There's something more valuable. It's God. It is God. So their perspective, it was off. The satraps were about competing. They weren't about betterment. We may not verbally say it with, with our own mouths, right, that we are our own God, but what actions do we have? What do our actions say about what we believe? Are we fighting to get things on our own? Or are we submitting our lives and our will to God? God, what do you have for me? So that's the perspective the satraps seemingly had. And then we look at the king. We look at the king and based on his actions and what is said about him in the word of God, it seems as if the king believed that there was a God, but it didn't affect the way that he lived. It didn't affect the decisions that he made. You see, he already had position. He already had power. He already had the kingdom. But for him, he, he, he didn't say, I'm I don't know if he was, something was wrong with him when these guys came to him and said, we, we, we want everyone to worship you. Anybody who believes in God and lives their life based upon who he says that they are, they would stop and go, wait, that's not right. Something is off there. That doesn't make sense. See, when God doesn't have an impact on how you live and the choices that you make, you by default, you make selfish choices. I lived that life for a really long time. I went to, I went to uh, you know, youth group and I went to church and, and, and I understood, man, there, there probably is a God. I understood that, but he didn't have an effect on the way that I lived because my perspective of God was that he was there for when I needed him and not all the time. If there's a need, if, if I get sick, I, I, I remember going through, uh, through a really tough challenge in high school, uh, and, and I remember uh, I wanted this girl to be my girlfriend, and she was saying no. <laughs> I remember putting the, um, our picture in the Bible. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> I need you. I need you, Lord. I, I, want, I want this relationship. But, but the truth is, my perspective on God was so off. He's not there for my material fleshly wants and desires. He's not just there in time of crises, but, but God is there all the time saying, if you would live and follow my word, that I will bring you fulfillment. I came that you may have life and life abundantly. You're, you're thinking that this is what I want. I want the position. I want the money. I want, I want to have power. But God's going, that's not going to give you the fulfillment that you need. Come and serve me all the time, and I will fulfill every desire need. Need, not want. I will fulfill your need. Do you find yourself worshiping the creation more than you do the creator? Romans 1, 25, 21 through 25 says all, that, that for although they knew God, they neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and bird and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creator 
are the creation rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. We look at the satraps' perspective of God, that they were their own. We look at the kings, and he knew who he was, but it didn't affect the way that he lived. You see, Daniel's perspective is the one that I want to hold on to here for just a moment because Daniel's perspective on God was that he was the only one and he was the only way. That God, whether he felt like it or he didn't feel like it, was what was deserving of his life. When things were easy, he prayed three times a day, and you know that because before any trial came, when he got the promotion and the king was about to put him over everybody, what did the satraps find? They found him still sitting there praying three times a day like it was, it was like drinking water. It was necessary. Why? Because God deserved it. God had that position in his life that everything revolved around him. When things were difficult, there was a law put into place that could get him killed for praying, he still put God first. There was nothing that was going to stop that. Nothing. Matter of fact, Daniel didn't just pray every day. Daniel surrounded himself with other godly men. He did. You know, I, I look back and I, and I said, let me, let me read some more of Daniel to get a better understanding about who he was, where he came from. In Daniel chapter 2, it says that Daniel was, was given a position of authority from the king at that time, who was Nebuchadnezzar. And, and, and because of Daniel's request, he got three men to come in and be over all kinds of things. Watch this, Daniel 2, 48 and 49. Then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over the whole providence of Babylon, as well as chief over all of the wise, his wise men. At Daniel's request... The king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He appointed them to be in charge of all the affairs of the providence of Babylon, and Daniel remained in the king's court. Isn't this interesting? Watch. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were men that, that despite the law, despite the culture, despite everybody telling them, you need to bow to this. You need to bow to this culture. Everyone else is doing it. You have to do it. I'm not going to do it because God is the only, I'm, I'm more scared of God than I am of you. Go ahead and take my life. I will be with him. And so what happened is the king threw them into the fiery furnace, as you guys all know. There was another in the fire, right? And so when they came out, the king called them out. And what did he do? He issued a decree all of the people of Babylon, of all of my jurisdiction, you will now serve the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How many kings need to learn this? And here you go, the same thing. Daniel, who's to say he didn't learn from them that God is going to be faithful? Here's the thing. When you say no to the peer pressure, or you say no to the culture, you say no to the world, and yes to God, you have no idea who you are influencing. You have no idea. When you have the right perspective on who God is, it gives you testimony. It gives you the ability to impact lives. And while you see it as maybe the greatest trial to submit to God instead of the world, when you do, other people see it, and you have no idea, they may impact an entire nation of people. Right? I look at it and I go, Daniel had to be faithful in the small things before he was faithful in the big. All throughout the book of Daniel, you see him bringing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know where the Daniel's fast came from? Because the king's food that he was trying to give to Daniel, Daniel said, I can't take that. It's going to defile me. Seems like a small thing. He chose to eat fruits and vegetables instead of eating the king's food and the king's wine. And that's where we got the Daniel's fast from. He was always a man of character. So when the time came, right, and the reason that I say that is because his perspective on God affected every decision that he made in his life. I'm going to step on a toe real quick. But when I look at the small decisions in my life, like listening to explicit music, it's not that big of a deal. It's like everybody loves Big Papa, right? It's, it's not that big of a deal. It's just... I, I, 
I'm not gonna let that affect the way that I live. But it's like, dude, does your perspective on God affect every decision you make? Because if it does, then, then you say, you know what? I like that music, but I'm gonna find something else. Right, rated, rated R movies, right? It's, it's only a little bit of nudity. I'll cover my eyes, it's, it's not a big deal. But if my perspective on God affects every decision that I make, then I say, you know what? I'm going to live above reproach. There is a line, I'm not even gonna come close to it. Why? Because I have so much more fulfillment choosing the Lord and everything that I do, it's not that big of a deal. But your actions are saying that God is important. When things are difficult and you need him and he's important when you're choosing what satisfies your flesh. I'm gonna end uh, the message this, this morning with a, with a poem that, that, uh, that I heard a while ago and, and whenever I am having some doubts or some questions about who God is in my life, this, this, I feel like this, this thing just shows up on my YouTube sometimes and it just wrecks me. And so I wanna share it with you this morning. It's called, That's My King. And it helps correct my perspective. It says this, my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define him. He's limitless, he's limitless love, he's enduringly strong, he's entirely sincere, he's eternally steadfast, he's immortally graceful, he's imperially powerful, he's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He is the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's the center savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He's fundamentally, he is the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder, do you know him today? He supplies strength to the weak. He is available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and he sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives the sinners. He discharges the debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent and beautifies the meek. I wonder, do you know him? It's quiet in this Baptist church this morning. He is the key to knowledge. He is the wellspring of wisdom. He is the doorway of deliverance. He is the pathway of peace. He is the roadway of righteousness. He is the highway of holiness. He is the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Was well, life, it's matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden, it is light. Come on, church. I wish I could describe him to you, but he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him, and Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yes, that's my king. That's my God. That's my Savior. He is good when it doesn't feel like it. He is good when on my best day in the time of promotion, he is good when I am sick, he is good. If my perspective could be shifted to understand that he is the God of the heavens and the earth and he knows my name, then I would let it affect every decision that I make in my life. He is holy and he is just. He is forgiving and he is full of grace.